But you mentioned the concept of genetics, and this is something you're an expert in. So you teach practitioners how to use genetics to personalize individuals' approach to nutrition. So can you tell your audience a little bit about which genes are important for personalizing food intake? Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, first of all, I'm not going to claim being expert in genetics. I don't think anybody is because it's in an infancy stage, right? Every week we have new studies. We're finding new genes. We're trying to connections. But I'm well-versed in it. I've learned a lot, and I do teach practitioners. We just, you know, we taught, we taught a three-day live event all about genetics. So how do we use it? Well, it's, it's a lot of things that we have to look at. So what are the genetics related to detoxification capacity? That's a critical piece and methylation because if our bodies can't detoxify the environment, we talked already about chemicals. If we can't break down the hormones that you know, need to be excreted after they're used and we break them down into harmful byproducts, for example, estrogen. You know, there's some liver pathways that break down estrogen from its form, it's used, got to get it out into different, what we call metabolites. And so there's a particular metabolite for hydroxyestrone that's very damaging and dangerous and causes proliferation in the system, meaning a, a tendency to cancer. And so it's one of the links to breast cancer. And people have certain pathways that are uh, sluggish, let's just say, in doing that. In doing that breakdown, they're at a higher risk of breast cancer. So uh, just to take that to a level, though, some of those pathways also detoxify other things, right? So the one with estrogen detoxifies caffeine. So you got people slugging down coffee all day. They're decreasing their ability to... Us to work with estrogen and get rid of the harmful estrogen, right? So decreasing the caffeine or eliminating completely in my world, but uh, it, it helps people to prevent breast cancer, right? So it, it, there's all these interactions. So I've created these amazing charts that have the detox ones and the blood pressure ones and the cardiac ones. So I don't have them all memorized. I have charts, right? But like say somebody has high blood pressure, which is very common with insulin resistance, right? And with diabetes, high blood pressure is part of that picture. So there's a bunch of genes, the ACE genes, the NOS genes, there's a whole bunch of others. And so I look them up and go, okay, let's look at your genes. Let's see which one. Oh, you have a tendency to high blood pressure. So it's really super important for us to get your blood sugar under control. You're a heart attack waiting to happen if you don't, right? And so let's work on that. So it helps. What I find, it helps people to get the motivation to do the stuff I know they need to do anyway, right? But personalizing the diet may come from how well do they handle fats? Do they have an APOE44 gene, right? Do they have some of these other genes that help to body break down fat? Those people need to be on a lower fat diet. People who have a lot of the tendencies towards the um, insulin resistance, there are a whole bunch of them. I've identified, I think I have like, 36 of them in my chart, maybe more. And there's a lot of um, issues with, like I have a lot of those genes. I have a super number of those genes. So I'm very sensitive to sugars and carbohydrates in my diet. I don't have the fat problem genes. So my diet is a whole foods plant-based fat where I have a lot of vegetables, greens, that's my mainstay, tons and tons of green leafy vegetables and cruciferous vegetables and rainbow colored vegetables, along with small amounts of fruit and um, as much whole food plant-based fat as I need. No oils, just avocados and coconut and sprouted nuts and seeds and olives, not olive oil, olives, right? So I eat well and I do well and I've taken time based on my genes, based on how I respond to know what is the best diet for me. And I teach practitioners to help to go through some of these charts and figure out, oh, this person needs to be away from their salt sensitives. So they do need to stay away from salt. This person tends towards you know, adrenal imbalances and probably needs a little bit more salt because the adrenal imbalances are causing them to pee it out. Those are just, that's just like in a nutshell of three days of, of education. Um, and I'm sure the whole, like you said, the gene world is, is a lot, a lot of information there. So, now that we understand the biology of endocrine disruption, tell us about the foods that cause endocrine disruption. Okay. I would just sum it up in most of the foods in the standard American diet. Seriously, right? So um, the breads, the, the, the uh, pasta, the meat, processed meat, especially the ham and the bologna and all those kinds of things that people are just slapping on their bread. And that's their lunch. It's like, where's the food? 
where's the nutrition? There's no greens, there's no fruit, there's no, you know, whole nuts and seeds and things like that. It's just like a bologna sandwich. That's like the, the epitome of endocrine disruption. Things that are heavily pesticided. So, you know, things that are mostly heavily pesticided, I would say, are the animal products because they're higher in the food chain. And so if they're eating the plants that are genetically modified, that are loaded with pesticides, they concentrate it in their fat and then people eat that and they're, they're just bombarded with toxins. I would say um, the soft drinks, the sugars, all those things, that, the fruit juices that come in bottles, that it, all of this stuff is damaging. The mayonnaise, the margarine, all of these things are damaging. And I get a lot of flack for saying this, but coffee and um, alcohol, those things are disruptive. Those things um, just damage the liver so the liver can't break down hurts the brain cells, hurt, affects the lining of the digestive tract, thins it so that it can't absorb as well. And you know, some people based on their genes can get away with a little bit, right? Um, alcohol, there's specific genes, the acetaldehyde, right? The acetaldehyde breakdown enzyme, I, uh, my genes are fine for that. Other people, their genes are not. Personally, I just don't touch alcohol because we have too much alcoholism in my family. And when I was younger, I overdid it and I couldn't control myself. So I don't ever touch it. But somebody without a problem with it can get away with maybe a glass of wine every month or two. Somebody who does have a problem with it needs to stay away from it because it's going to be disruptive in the system. This is very, very informative. So can you go into a little bit of detail here about uh, the role that conventional produce and organic produce may have in endocrine disruption. Is there, is there a dramatic difference in how much endocrine disruption can happen by eating non-organic food? Yeah, so you know it, it's endocrine disruption, disruption, but they're also neurotoxins. So the pesticides that are used in this food are neurotoxins. So there's endocrine disruptors and neurotoxins. So it's a double whammy here, right? So organic as much as possible because you're loading your system with all these these toxins and depending on the state of your liver depending on how well it can detoxify and let me tell you somebody with perfect genetics who's lived a standard american lifestyle with lots of exposures and toxicities and stresses is still not going to be handling those toxins very well somebody with disrupted nutrition oh my god they they're the people who go oh my gosh this salad mustn't be organic I'm feeling it. You know, they just feel off. They feel these, these toxicity symptoms right away. Some people are real sensitive, the canaries in the coal mine, and others are not. But just, despite whatever it might look like on the outside, whether you're having symptoms, it's still causing damage on the inside. And that's what we have to look at. So yeah, conventional versus organic is huge. We can't do 100%. We try, right? I'm sure you guys try as hard as I do to do 100%. Sometimes you're on the road, you're traveling. And we look at the dirty dozen and we just don't eat those because they have the highest levels of pesticides. We try to, you know, if we have to eat nuts and they're in the shell, they don't get as much. So it's just a, it's a trade-off. But I think that um, organic as much as possible is super important. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Now, we saw your presentation at the Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, which was excellent. Mm -hmm. And you. you went over 12 foods that are great for someone who wants to improve their endocrine function. So maybe you can review some of those real quick. I'd love for you to share that with our audience. Sure. Um, so we want foods that are loaded with antioxidants and loaded with the nutrients that the body needs. So I like Green leafy vegetables, top my list. Just, you know, lots of greens. I love arugula and kale and, and collard greens and romaine lettuce and bok choy and sprouts was another one. So sprouts, amazingly important because they're so dense with nutrition. Um, the cruciferous vegetables, super, super important for hormone balance. And there's chemicals in the, in the there. Sulforaphane is one of them that actually helps with liver detoxification. And liver detoxification is super important for dissipating the effects of the endocrine disruption. Um, I love chia seeds. Um, some people like hemp seeds and flax seeds better. I like chia and I like chia and hemp. I'm not a super fan of flax just from a they get in my teeth perspective, but I love chia seeds and I make a chia porridge and I make this really robust, like my first meal of the day will often be like a soaked chia seeds and make like a porridge and I put some hemp seeds on it and I may grind up some almonds and coconut and just make this amazing thing and have it with a big green smoothie. 
right? So I always eat greens at every meal. And I think that's a real important one. Um, how many did I do? <laughs> I, there's so many that. Um, yeah, no, that, that's good. That's a good right? general order. That's blueberries fine. are great. Anyway, yeah. there are, there's a lot of them, and blueberries are another one, and um, mushrooms. Mushrooms can be super amazing. I've found that mushrooms can help a lot with like the reishi, the reishi mushrooms and the chaga and cordyceps, but also just your, your regular garden variety, as long as they're organic. Uh, mushrooms, right? That they have so many effects on the thyroid and and on supporting the immune system. Uh, so I love the mushrooms, and there's a whole bunch more. 